Hello, good morning, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's ACM Tech Talk. This uh, webcast is part of the ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and professional development, serving a global membership of computing professionals and students. I'm your co-moderator today uh, for this session. Uh, my name is Satish Kusuri. I'm a Riley Professor of Civil Engineering at Purdue University uh, with expertise in transportation networks, uh, connected autonomous vehicles and supply chains. And my co-moderator is Professor Vani Tagarwal, also from Purdue University in the School of Industrial Engineering and School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Um, together, we also co-edit this new journal in ACM called the Journal of Autonomous Transportation Systems, which is very relevant to today's talk. And we are really excited to be leading this journal. Uh, and we have a fantastic uh, editorial board supporting this the mission of this journal. Um, if you go to the web page, you will see uh, that uh, the journal has already received a few submissions. We are actively organizing special issues on topics related to autonomous transportation. We'll be also uh, be visiting various conferences, organizing workshops related to that. So folks interested in this topic, definitely submit your uh, papers to this journal. And we're re really looking forward to engaging a broader community in autonomous transportation. So let's move on to the ACM highlights. Um, for those of you uh, unfamiliar with ACM, um, here is some information about the educational and professional development uh, uh, resources. Um, so you can see some of the highlights on your screen in terms of the various uh, uh, opportunities, some of the numbers related to how many people have uh, read the content on the ACM webpage, uh, the type of awards that are there, how many fellows, 1300 plus fellows that are there. So you can access the ACM digital library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature. Um, the, some of the leading publications and global conferences that draw top experts on broad spectrum of computing topics and support for education and research, including curricular development. And the top awards in this space, ACM Turing and the ACM Prize in Computing Awards. And also there's the ACM Code of Ethics, a collection of uh, principles and guidelines designed to help computing professionals make ethically responsible decisions in professional practice. Let's move to the welcome slide. And before we get started, we'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items, um, which are on this uh, on the slide in front of you. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A feature. Uh, we'll organize all the questions towards the end and we'll take the questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, we'll try to address as many as possible within the time constraint that we actually have. Uh, as a note, the session is actually being recorded and will be archived. So you'll receive an email notification when it becomes available. And uh, you can check the learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming uh, webcasts in this series. And at the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open up on your screen. Please take a minute to uh, fill, it, fill it out and help us improve this uh, uh, tech talks, okay? All right. So. Let's move on to our uh, highlight of the uh, of this event today. So today's presentation is an AI first approach to accelerating autonomous trucking by Raquel Urtasen. And a brief introduction, uh, Raquel Urtasen is a founder and CEO of Wabi, a full professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto, and a co-founder of the Vector Institute for AI. She is a world leading expert in AI for self-driving cars. Her research interests include machine learning, computer vision, robotics, AI, and remote sensing. Her lab was selected as an NVIDIA uh, NVAIL lab. So she's a recipient of many awards, including the NSCRC EWR Stacy Award and NVIDIA Pioneers of AI Award, a Ministry of Education, and Innovation Early Researcher Award, three Google Faculty Research Awards, an Amazon Faculty Research Award, two NVIDIA Pioneer Research Awards, a Connaught New Researcher Award, a Falona Family Researcher Award, uh, and many Best Paper Awards. 
She was also named uh, Chetline 2018 Woman of the Year and one of Toronto's 2018 Top Influencers by Adweek Magazine. And Raquel was a panelist at the ACM 75th anniversary celebration in 2022. So Raquel, without further ado, please take it away. Thank you, and thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, very excited to be here today uh, to be talking about uh, self-driving and in particular self-driving tracks. Um, hopefully you can all see my screen. All right, so um, I think it's worth to start by saying that uh, self-driving is really one of the most exciting and important technologies uh, of our generation, right? And once it's going to be solved at the scale, it's really going to change the world as we know it today. In particular, right, more than two people die every year on the roads. So we're definitely going to save many, many lives. There is many people as well that cannot, uh, you know, have access to transportation, uh, you know, something that really affects their daily lives. So they cannot move from point A to point B. It's also going to transform the landscape of our cities, um, you know, hopefully bringing much more green spaces and removing a lot of the parking spots that, you know, are more than 20% of, uh, you know, a lot of our city landscapes. Um, one of the things that I really care about as well is that we are in the middle of a logistic crisis, uh, in particular with, uh, you know, with COVID got even worse. And self-driving trucking uh, is really going to transform and improve the situation that we have today, where automation uh, is a must. Now, a little bit about uh, you know who we are and what we do. Um, so, you know, as I was said in the introduction, I'm the CEO, and founder of uh, a new company, uh, very exciting, uh, really bringing the next generation of self-driving technology to the market, uh, which was founded a year and a half ago, uh, both in we have offices in California as well as uh, in Toronto. Um, and we are, you know, we have the best in class uh, investors in order to really bring this next generation of technology. And today I'm going to tell you, you know, a lot of the things of, you know, why this is, uh, you know, a very, very exciting endeavor. And in what sense we are very, very different to, you know, um, some of the, uh, you know, the developments that have been uh, over the last two decades. We are really uh, laser focused on uh, trying to solve, as I say, the logistic crisis on a have to have L4 uh, tracking solution, which means that, uh, you know, once the, the product is ready, there will be no driver on the cab. Um, and we are bringing technology that uh, is really uh, uh, built to commercialize from day one. This is very important because, you know, oftentimes we've seen a lot of demos uh, in terms of self-driving, but there is a big difference between a demo uh, versus, you know, something that is, you know, safe and reliable and works all the time. Uh, we are, you know, in a great, uh, you know, position today uh, to really bring this, uh, you know, this product forward. Uh, we actually fundraise, uh, I fundraise on the first day of the company and uh, raise the largest Series A in Canadian history. Um, so very exciting stuff over there. Um, so let me, tell, you know, uh, let me tell you more about, uh, you know, why we are actually doing tracking. Um, you know, over the past, uh, you know, 20 years I've been working in AI and more than 12 now in cell driving. And to me, it's very clear that where this uh, technology really is going to uh, be deployed at scale will be uh, uh, in tracking much more, you know, much before, uh, you know, looking at robot taxis as well as last mile delivery. Um, and the reason is really twofold. Uh, first is that there is an absolute need for automation uh, in terms of logistics, uh, because is, there is a, sh a chronic shortage of drivers that is just getting worse. And, you know, all the possible customers, shippers, fleets, uh, they all understand that automation is the only path forward. Being a truck driver is also a very, very hard job, particularly uh, if you look at long haul tracking, which is what we are doing, where, you know, folks need to go on the road, you know, for many, many uh, weeks at a time. And it's really hard, for example, to, uh, uh, you know, have a family. So, you know, a lot of the uh, new folks don't, uh, don't want to have, uh, don't want to be a long haul truck driver. At the same time, you look at the technological challenge. Uh, if you are driving trucks, most of the driving, you're actually going to do it on highways, uh, which is a more structured environment than our cities. I live in Toronto, and then driving in the city is actually quite, quite insane. There is so many situations and things that, you know, you need to be so alert uh, as you are driving. Um, it's very, very different uh, sort of in the city where uh, rare events can happen, but they happen much less often than uh, uh, where would you, you drive in our cities? Uh, 
Um, other uh, on top of this uh, is a great you know economic opportunity uh, you know yes in North America it's a trillion dollar market logistics is one one of the only you know remaining markets that haven't really been disturbed by technology so there is a great opportunity there uh, to bring uh, you know a lot of uh, you know to solve a lot of the uh, the problems that we see today so those are the the main reasons why uh, we are really focusing on tracking uh, to start with and then we will see what else we do in the future now, if we look at the industry uh, today, uh, so there's been a lot of development since the DARPA challenge, right? Which is almost two, uh, two decades ago, which really pioneered a lot of the research as well as efforts uh, in this field. Now, there is, you know, there has been great progress, but when it comes to commercialization, uh, there, you know, what you see out there is that it's very, very limited. There is, you know, very, uh, very small, simple operation domains. And this promise of self-driving everywhere is actually very far from being fulfilled. Um, and the reason, you know, and you probably are thinking, well, what's preventing self-driving vehicles from being everywhere today? Let me give you uh, a sense of, you know, what are, you know, some of the big issues that uh, that we observe in the in the industry. Um, so if you think, uh, you know, about it, there is, as I mentioned, there is been, you know, significant progress, but the industry has really hit a wall. Uh, you know, they have us in thought to a particular, you know, uh, level of performance that is not at the level that you need in order to really deploy safely, safely in large operation domains. And in my opinion, the reason of this really lies in the technology that is employed. Um, the, uh, you know, the approach uh, that we see in the industry, you know, um, uh, the different players have really consolidated in terms of you know how they are trying to tackle this problem into uh, utilizing a uh, hand engineer robotics centric approach uh, to cell driving that um, you can think of it as you know you have this very complex problem where you have sensor data as input and then you need to come up with uh, what is the right decision for the cell driving vehicle at every point in time um, and the hand engineer approach is basically to uh, you know decompose and conquer which basically, you know, you have these complex problems and then you basically build, uh, you know, you divide it into perception, prediction, motion planning, control, and every one of these models you divide into even more soft problems. And then from there, you go into even smaller and smaller problems. So every engineer working on this field is actually uh, basically just um, uh, working in a very, very sp uh, narrow, specific, uh, you know, problem that, uh, but that doesn't have the understanding or how everything actually works together. And it's very, very hard to actually build, uh, you know, in a bottoms up approach, uh, you know, a solution for such a very, very complex problem as self driving. So this results in an overly complicated software stack that is very brittle, um, that uh, is very unwieldy and requires, you know, a very, very large uh, number of engineers uh, to be working on, on you know, all these different subtasks. Now, there has been, uh, you know, some of these models utilize AI and there is a little bit of automation within the models, but the whole system, uh, you know, has to be manually tuned uh, one model at a time. And that uh, prevents, uh, you know, from really making big changes, prevents from coming with a very robust solution. The second problem of the industry is the way that testing uh, is happening today, where uh, because uh, the simulation systems are actually pretty primitive, they need to really drive testing miles, you know, millions of miles for some of the competitors in order to understand what are the next issues to solve. And this is, you know, not sustainable. This is something that is not the, you know, the safest approach, and it's something that also doesn't scale. So we need to come up with, you know, a solution that is different. This is also very capital intensive. Right? You will see that, you know, some of the of the players out there, uh, they require, you know, half a billion, multiple billion dollars a year uh, in order to continue the development. Right. So it's hard hard to sustain something like this uh, in markets like we see today. Um, so let me show you, uh, you know, from now on, I will, I will be talking about, you know, what we have uh, built, what we are building at Wabi that really tackles these two problems with a very, very different approach, which is going to be much more holistic and it's going to be very AI centric. Okay, so before I tell you more and I go into the details, I'm going to play a video that hopefully you can see and hear well of, uh, you know, Wabi driver, which is our solution to autonomous tracking. The future of trucking is autonomous. That means safer roads, a stronger supply chain, a new era 
of logistics. At Wabi, we believe that to unlock this new era, we need to build the next generation of technology. Meet the Wabi driver. Powered by our AI first approach, the Wabi driver is ready for trucking now. Let's take a closer look. The Wabi driver has two components. The advanced virtual driver as software, together with sensors and compute as hardware. It includes LIDARs, cameras, and radars for increased redundancy and safety. At its core, the Wabi driver is a full autonomy stack. From sensing the world to decision-making, the entire system as a whole automatically learns from data. Thanks to Wabi World, our groundbreaking simulator, we're able to expose the Wabi driver to the vast diversity of experiences needed to hone its driving skills, which would be impossible otherwise. This makes it safer and smarter before the wheels even start turning. The Wabi driver is a single AI system that is both modular and interpretable, which means we can trace every choice it makes and we can validate its decisions. The Wabi driver has superior generalization capabilities. It can apply learned skills to new situations and geographies it has never seen before, unlocking new autonomous routes with unprecedented speed. We built the Wabi driver with production intent from day one. It's designed to be easily integrated on the assembly line for a safe, reliable, and scalable product. And it's highly flexible, adaptable to multiple redundant truck platforms and sensor configurations. We are unveiling a new paradigm, safe, scalable, and ready for the road. The future of trucking is autonomous. The future of trucking is here. All right, so hopefully you could uh, you could hear that well. So um, I'm gonna go into uh, quite a bit of details in terms of you know our approach to hardware, as well as autonomy and simulation, so that you can get a sense of uh, you know what the next generation of self-driving trucking uh, really looks like. Um, so in particular, right, if you wanna work in self-driving, our product is really um, has a component that is the hardware. Uh, where uh, you know this involves or um, has the both the sensors as well as the compute that get integrated into uh, what's called an OEM platform. In this case, you know the truck that you see in the picture over here, um, uh, as well as the software that uh, you know using those sensors and compute needs to drive the truck autonomously, uh, you know from point A uh, to point B. Now, if you look at uh, our hardware approach. Uh, one of the things that uh, you will see is that, uh, you know, it's very important for safety and redundancy that you actually use multiple sensors, right? There is, uh, you know, some folks out there, some companies that, uh, you know, think that with, you know, cameras alone is a solution. For us, you know, safety is at the core of what we do. Uh, so we utilize, you know, uh, many different sensors uh, on board uh, the vehicle. Uh, what is important for building really a production ready uh, a truck is that to build you know the sensor pods in a way that they are plug and play lightweight and simple to maintain and service and clean uh, and that's what you you see over here in uh, you know in the truck uh, in the picture where there is actually four sensor pods uh, you know containing all the different sensors um, also, uh, it's important that, you know, you can really uh, integrate uh, the sensors at the assembly line. Um, and we believe that uh, this is very important uh, because you need to build a scalable product, but also because you want to build something that is safe and reliable. And aftermarket installation is not how you can actually uh, build something that, you know, has the level of safety uh, that we believe is necessary. Um, important as well is that, as you will see with, uh, you know, the, as you see with the, uh, our truck is that it's very aerodynamic. Uh, you almost don't see the sensor pods. Um, and this is in a striking contrast with, you know, some of our competitors, which utilize an approach that is called the unibrow, where you will see this extremely heavy, uh, clunky sort of, uh, uh, you know, sensor configuration uh, on top of the vehicle, uh, which makes it, uh, you know, uh, uh, very hard to to have any full savings. Instead, uh, you know, our truck, you know, is uh, is difficult to the you know to actually distinguish it from a regular truck, and that's important because of the sustainability uh, of our approach. 
um, also is very, very flexible. Uh, some, you know, one of the things that I think is really cool in, in our approach is that actually the sensors that we utilize and their configuration, where they are located and which sensors they are, uh, was actually uh, selected to be the best configuration in simulation. And I will show you in a second the simulator that enable us to do things like this. And that's also what is uh, enabled us to have a first generation of trucks that looks like the nth generation or better than our competitors. Uh, finally, uh, you know, what we are building here is a complete solution, right? That is uh, really built for OEM integration at the factory level. Um, let me tell you a little bit uh, about the software um, and in particular our autonomy uh, approach. So I mentioned before that the industry is, is really consolidating into this hand engineer approach. Um, so our approach is built really for, with an AI lens uh, where automation is everywhere. What do I mean by this is that the entire software stack is able to learn as a whole in a single step, single push of a button uh, from data. And this is extremely important because this gives you the automation necessary to really speed up the development process. Also, it gives you the ability to learn the software stack to be best for the final task of driving instead of tuning the models right for you know, surrogate objectives that are not uh, correlated uh, with the task of driving. And on top of this, uh, you also can learn much more complex functions that generalize much better. Um, so it's a very, very, you know, this is a, a huge enabler in terms of uh, the software stack. Um, so it's end-to-end -end trainable, but at the same time, it's modular and interpretable, uh, which is uh, key for a safety critical system because you need to enable uh, validation and verification. Um, the other key important component of uh, our approach is that uh, in order to really understand how your system behaves, as well as to expose the uh, Wabi driver to all the uh, situations, rare cases, safety critical cases, accidents, et cetera, uh, we employ our simulator that is uh, super, super realistic, uh, closed loop simulator, um, that is you know, a huge differentiator with respect to the rest of the industry. And our approach at the end of the day has superior generalization capabilities, is able to handle situations it has never observed before, and it can expand to brand new geographies uh, super, super fast. And that's very, very important because, you know, it's not about who can, uh, you know, have a self-driving track in a small operation domain is who can actually scale this to really solve the logistic crisis at scale. And I think it's worth to note that, you know, when I say we have an AI first approach to contrast into probably what most of you uh, have in mind when I say this, right? Oftentimes, you know, people think that uh, when you actually automatically learn from data, you have to be bound to have an approach that is a black box approach, something where there is, you know, this neural network, magic neural network in the middle, right? Where uh, it's gonna learn, you know, to perform the task of driving, right? So our approach does not look like this. It's not a black box approach. Um, and because this lacks interpretability, you cannot validate and verify and requires way too many examples to learn. Okay. Our approach is something that looks, uh, you know, at a, you know, from a very high level, uh, you know, has a flavor of having perception, prediction, motion planning control, but at the same time, you have the ability to really um, have much more complex interface between these models and potentially, you know, be accessing raw data, even at the motion planning and control level. And this is extremely important because uh, in the classical approach, you are bounded by very discompressed interfaces that basically once you make a mistake, it's impossible to recover from. Okay. So uh, we, uh, you know, thanks to a new generation of AI algorithms, we are able to have the best of both worlds, interpretability, modularity, at the same time as push of a button, you learn the entire system. Okay, and that's something that, you know, doesn't exist out there. And the last bit, uh, right, is the simulator that really enables this learning, enables this testing at scale. Um, so I'm going to spend quite a bit of time now talking about the simulator, and in particular, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of videos to, uh, you know, see whether it passes the Turing test uh, for you and whether, you know, you can make, a, you know, you can see the difference between the simulator and reality. All right, so before, let me quickly go into uh, why I say that the industry, the tools in the industry for simulation are still fairly primitive. Um, so... Uh, uh, typically, the industry utilizes in production two different types of simulations. Um, uh, the first type is what they call uh, log replay 
where basically uh, is you replay uh, data that you have already captured in the past, and then you look at you know what your perception, prediction, motion planning system will have done with the, the new changes that you have uh, performed in your software stack. Now, this is uh, not a great solution, right? Because uh, you cannot change the sensors, uh, what you observe, which means that you're not really testing in a reactive manner your full system. Um, and that doesn't really allow you uh, to uh, to really understand, you know, compounding errors that can, uh, you know, result in critical, uh, you know, safety critical situations and, you know, big, uh, big mistakes. So that, you know, it's a tool that, you know, gives you some information, but uh, uh, not, not a lot of information once you, you know, catch big regressions. The second type of simulation uh, that people use in the industry is uh, you know where they create some behaviors of uh, typically in a structured manner of kind of canonical situations that you might observe in the way, uh, in the real world, and then they test this they test the motion planning under those situations. Right. So the problem of such a uh, such a testing is that you're only testing one module and you test it under ideal conditions. Again, you're not going to see how the chain of uh, mistakes actually can can have you know big effects. And also you're only testing a sub part of the system, right? So the consequence of this is gonna be that you need to really drive millions of miles in the real world. We started to see more on a, a experimental researchy, um, I will say, um, fashion in the industry also, uh, the use of synthetic data. Uh, but as you can see over here, uh, you know, the industry uses game engines where you know they look cool, but for uh, you know the system, you know the perception system, there is a big difference between this and the real world. There is a big domain gap, um, so you can't really uh, train and test uh, you know uh, a lot with uh, this type of data because uh, you know it looks very very different from reality. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, right, the consequence of this is that yes, people use simulation, but they need to actually do um, a lot of uh, testing in the real world to really understand, you know, issues in the software stack. So with the simulator I'm gonna show you, we are gonna basically change totally the equation of this. We're gonna invert this pyramid and we're gonna be able to do most of our development in simulation. And then you only need the real world for the last step, which is validation and verification. And this is a game changer, changer in the industry. Okay, so let me show you why our simulator is so special. So, um, uh, so Wabi, uh, Wabi World, which is our simulator, uh, you know, is reactive and immersive, meaning that uh, we need to create something that is like reality, so that the input to the software stack is the same, is the sensor readings, right? The same as it would be in the real world. So actually the LiDAR and the cameras here that you see on the left, this is actually simulation. It's not the real world. Um, so we need to do this at scale, right? Um, so the industry typically, they use artists to create assets and things by hand. Very, very expensive, not realistic. Instead, here we use our uh, proprietary AI algorithms to actually clone the entire world. Every time that you see something, automatically gets imported into the simulation, okay? And I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of demos of how you can, you know, of uh, the kind of results that you can do uh, with, uh, with this type of approach. Also, we can generate with our uh, generative models all these different situations that might arise in the world. And then not only we can you know, um, test in the simulator, we can also learn to behave better. All right. Um, so so you know, in a nutshell, how does this work in a little bit more details is that we're going to have the world state of uh, you know, what the world is around you. Uh, we're going to simulate the, how the sensors in the vehicle will have observed that scene. Uh, that's going to be the input uh, to our software stack. The software stack is going to come with uh, come up with a decision, right, in order to drive safely. Uh, that's going to update uh, where uh, the self-driving vehicle is in simulation. The world around you, or the actors, the traffic participants, are going to react to your actions, and that's going to create a new situation in the world. Okay, and then you continue this, and this is like reality, right? It's like a video game where you react to everything and they react to you as well. Okay, so it's immersive, it's reactive, and we're going to do this with all the diversity and scale of the real world. And the last piece is that you also want to understand how well you are doing, so you need to also automate how you evaluate, uh, you know, how you decide whether actually the self-driving vehicle is doing the right thing versus not. That's part of a very important key component uh, of the simulator as well. 
All right, so I said I was going to show you, uh, you know, a, um, a whole bunch of videos. Uh, and um, uh, in these videos, I'm going to show you some of the capabilities uh, of uh, our simulator. And in particular, going to be focusing on cameras. And the reason why is that you are all used to actually seeing images and videos. So you can judge the quality of this. You are less used to see later. Probably most of you, you have never seen later before in your life. Okay, so um, our simulator obviously is multi-sensors and they are all consistent. All right, so, so what I'm gonna show you is that, as I mentioned before, is that every time that you know, we drive, we can clone everything in the world and utilize this to create new simulations of things that have never happened in that world, okay? Um, so let's see this with uh, you know, a, few, uh, a few situations and scenarios and capabilities. So on the left-hand side, it's actually reality, okay? This, uh, this is a, a log that was captured by just driving around San Francisco, okay? Where we are just driving in traffic. And on the right hand side, I'm re-simulating every pixel and I'm showing you what will this scene will have, will have looked like if there was no traffic in San Francisco, which obviously never, never happens, okay? And this gives you an idea of how accurate our uh, reconstruction of the 3D environment is and our simulation of that environment, right? All right, now, uh, you know, we can actually do this at a scale, right? All this is automatic, right? Yeah, thanks to our, uh, you know, digital uh, cloning, uh, you know, digital twins uh, algorithms. Um, and what you can see here is that you can actually, you know, do this, you know, for all, the, you know, all the possible situations and things that might happen in the world. I always get asked into, but what happens at night? What happens when there is, you know, sunshine or, you know, the sun is actually in front of you? So you see here, you know, some examples of uh, everything here actually in this video is, um, is simulation, okay? So we are reconstructing here and re-simulating the scene that actually happened in the real world. And what I, when I call actor removal is where he has re-simulated that scenario, that scene, if it was empty of any dynamic objects. Okay, uh, on, as I said, all this is happening automatically in the simulator, right? And all from just a single footage of, uh, uh, of data, right? So it's mind blowing if you can suddenly, everything that you have observed becomes part of your simulation and you can compose, right? This is, you know, different scale, different level of fidelity than anything that you have seen before. All right, so now we are gonna make modifications of the dynamic actors as well. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is, again, the original thing, what happened in reality on the left, and on the right, every pixel is uh, simulated, okay? And what I'm doing here is that I'm actually showing, uh, you know, a simulation where, uh, you know, the vehicle that took a left turn, uh, you know, what would have looked like if actually aborted that left turn and instead decided to come back into our lane. This is creating a safety critical situation where we have to slow down to make sure that we don't run into the uh, into the vehicle in front. Okay, and as you can see here, right, is extremely realistic. You probably will not have said that actually this is synthetic, right? Um, let's do uh, more, more. Uh, you know, we're gonna play with uh, more things here. Uh, so what I'm showing you here is that the hopefully you see my mouse. The vehicle here on the left was never in this scene. Okay, so we can import vehicles that we capture anywhere else in the world into our simulation for, you know, creating variations of this scenario, right? It's a very, very powerful idea as well. Then uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to flip into who is doing what. Uh, so the gray car and the white car now are flipping to who is who, right? And then you see here again that, you know, super realistic, it looks like real, uh, real footage. Uh, next thing that I'm going to show is, which is also very important, it needs to be immersive, meaning that you need to simulate also different viewpoints of this scenario because as you are testing your new software stack, it's going to drive differently to whoever, you know, whether it's a, you know, an agent or a person that uh, drove the original footage, right? So you need to simulate the environment in a way that is, uh, you know, from a different viewpoint uh, from, uh, from what happened in reality. Right. So I'm showing you this capability by just moving the camera and then showing you how it would have looked like if we were actually driving on the right lane instead of the left lane. And obviously we can do this um, at scale. This is what you're going to see here, right? Again, all these different scenarios and things that you saw before where we are actually changing the viewpoint, right? So that you can see how realistic it is. And now we're going to move from uh, how will this scene uh, be uh, seen if I was in a car versus in a truck, 
right? The viewpoint is much higher from a track, right? Um, and what is um, very exciting on this as well is that every single thing that we ever capture, uh, you know, every data uh, can actually be utilized regardless of whether we change platforms, regardless of whether we change sensors, et cetera. Right, this is not what's happening in the industry where if you make any cha changes to your system, uh, you know, you need to throw all the data from before. Okay, again, super, super uh, realistic over here. Um, and if you want to know a little bit of uh, what's behind the scenes here, um, so it's a um, you know, new, uh, I would say, AI technology that utilizes a combination of physics as well as AI. Okay, so it's physics inspired, but it's not just physics. You can have this level of realism with just physics. Cool. Um, so, so now we can create all sorts of scenarios to test uh, our software stack, right? And as I mentioned, this is going to be in an immersive and reactive manner, meaning that uh, every uh, single actor is going to react to you, and you have to react to the environment as well. Okay, like the uh, um, vehicle over here is going to, uh, you know, in this case, it cut in front of us, and we are, we are going to react to it. Uh, and in this case, the one behind is actually reacting to us by slowing down because. We we have decided to do something different that will happen in reality, right? Now, um, oftentimes, you know, people ask about, you know, how do you know, like, uh, which scenarios to generate and how do you generate these scenarios? Um, so it's very important that you use a combination of, uh, you know, different techniques for this, uh, depending on the use case that you're trying, or what you're trying to do. It's important that you have a way to create these scenarios uh, you know, in a programmatic manner. This is, uh, for example, for system engineer and safety engineers that want to test specific capabilities, they want to be able to control this scenario. Okay, So uh, you know, within Wabi World, you can do this with just a few lines of code. At the same time, I, I showed you before how you can import anything that happened in reality and then uh, you know, modify it to have you know, different configurations as well. Um, other, uh, so that, you know, again, everybody is reacted to you and you react to them. Other things that we can do is we can actually generate uh, uh, with our, uh, you know, deep generative models, uh, you know, traffic situations that are very realistic. Uh, and we can also generate, you know, uh, in, you know, maps and uh, uh, maps, for example, and variations that uh, are not, uh, you know, something that doesn't necessarily exist exactly in our highways, for example. And that's the way that, you know, you can really generate at the scale, uh, you know, a many, many different situations, right? You have sample from the generative model and, you know, you can sample an infinite number of these uh, situations. Uh, but that's not sufficient, right? Because as your system gets better and better and better, you are going to need to run many, many simulations in order to find your problem. So the next thing that, or the next uh, uh, capability that the simulator has is to play adversary. And this is really, really interesting, where the simulator is an AI system that plays adversary against uh, the software stack that is another AI system, OK? And basically what the, the simulator does is that it's looking at how the software stack reacts and it's creating scenarios that with high probability, they're gonna be very, very difficult to handle for that particular software stack. And why is this so important? Because um, we can actually find potential issues of our software stack in a very, very efficient manner. Okay. All the simulations, all this stuff runs in the cloud, right? But you wanna you know, be able to understand if you have any, any issues uh, with little compute. And that's where this mode of adversarial uh, simulation is extremely important. All right, and yes, uh, to give you a little bit of color of how you can do this, right? So this is again, the, the block dia diagram of the simulator uh, where we're gonna use the evaluator that is, you know, for every single, you know, time step is able to tell us, you know, what we are doing well versus not, uh, which system or part of the system is not performing well, right? And we are gonna utilize this evaluator to turn the different actors into adversaries, okay? Uh, by just um, incorporating a feedback loop, loop between the evaluator and now the actors that are the traffic participants. Um, so something else that is also very important to when you do simulation is that you shouldn't just simulate agents that, uh, you know, under the same model. And the reason of this is that you want to make sure that you're not overfitting to a particular behavior model of your agents, right? You, you want to make sure that no matter what happens in reality, uh, you are able to react. And the way that we do this is by having a zoo of uh, different, different behavioral models that are very, very different in nature, 
and then basically sampling from those uh, in order to create scenarios and situations uh, where to test and train our software stack within enabling, you know, with those, you know, any of these programmatic real world scenarios in native models and adversaries. You can actually plug and play, you know, with ESI configuration, uh, what you want to do uh, for the set of scenarios that you want to generate. All right, and the last bit is that uh, not only is about testing, right? Uh, it's also about training. And I'm showing you here, you know, a, a very naive planner that starts in the world and you know is having difficulties. Uh, it's gonna collide, so it's not doing well. Uh, but it receives feedback from the evaluator, and then it's learning to be better and better and better. And at the end, it's able to really reach this long, um, you know, merging into a highway is actually a pretty difficult uh, situation uh, if you have a tight space. Uh, in terms of you know you need long term uh, uh, long term planning, and is able to learn all these skills just from the simulation alone in this case. All right, and the way you do this is that again you use the evaluator to give feedback back to the software stack, and the software stack, the end-to-end -end, uh, learnable software stack, is able to take that feedback and adjust itself to behave better in those scenarios. Right, this is a very very powerful idea. All right, so, so by using this, you can actually really significantly uh, reduce the number of miles that you drive in the real world. So this is much more sustainable, right? Um, uh, for the, you know, much better for the environment. It's much safer because by the time we actually put a system in the real, uh, in the real world, it's actually extremely performant and we really understand how well the system does and what can do versus not. Right, um, so it's a much much safer solution, and it's much more affordable. You don't need, you know, these large fleets uh, that drive, you know, uh, driving millions of miles. An extremely expensive uh, process. This is what you need, you know, uh, billions of dollars in order to actually develop the classic uh, approach. Um, so this is a very very different, very differentiated technology, uh, which is much more affordable, much more scalable, much more flexible. Uh, which I really believe that it will close that leap between where we are today in sort of driving and when we need to be to really safely deploy this technology in the real world. And this real world is really waiting for uh, for us to, um, uh, you know, to have a huge impact uh, in, uh, in everyone. All right, so just to summarize in terms of what the technology that I show you today, uh, you know, what are the characteristics, right? So is uh, much more cost efficient. You actually, you know, uh, need a, a a very, very small fraction of uh, what you need in order to develop this technology compared to you know, the classical approach. You are actually much faster thanks to the automation uh, and you can actually make you know, step changes uh, instead of having incremental updates such as you typically need to do. There is no need for large operations, right? So you have a much more streamlined approach. Much safer, right? In two fronts, much safer because you don't need to drive so much, right? There's always a risk every time that you have a physical system in the real world. Right, and it's a system under development, right? So we minimize that risk. And at the same time, since we can expose the, um, the self driving vehicle to all the rare cases, all the different situations, safety critical accidents, et cetera, we actually uh, train it and it's ready to you know, handle many more situations uh, you know, prior to even being ever uh, on the road. Uh, it's a highly scalable solution, right? Has superior generalization uh, capabilities based on the, you know, thanks to the AI technology that we utilize, uh, plus the empowerment of the simulator in order uh, that is really enabling that uh, new AI technology to really learn uh, from data. All right, so so it's going to be much much faster for us to really scale from you know deployment, which in cell driving you know it's not that one day you know uh, it's here it's solved and then you will see you know cell driving vehicles everywhere. Um, the way that this technology is really going to be uh, deployed in the real world is that you will see small operation domains right and it will grow from this right and this technology enables you to unlock you know new lanes uh, in the highway new places you know much much faster uh, than anything else. And it's highly flexible uh, because, uh, you know, every, you know, thanks to the simulator and the particular type of AI technology, we are able to, you know, change sensors. We are able to change uh, the different trucks to utilize different OEMs, etc., um, uh, in a way that, you know, we can train the system and decide into what is the best configuration to handle all the situations prior to building any hardware. 
Okay. And this was extremely important for, for us, uh, you know, having access to Wobby World to this simulator and enable us to actually build a first generation of trucks that look like the trucks I show you today, uh, which are, you know, next generation from the industry, right? So our first generation is more advanced than the generations that you see for players that have been in the industry for, you know, five, 10, uh, 10 years. So it's a big, big empowering of this, uh, this approach. All right. So um, I'm going to just conclude by saying that, you know, cell driving uh, is, uh, remains, you know, one of the most exciting things of uh, our generation and is really going to change the world as we know it today. And, uh, you know, we, you know, with the technology I show you today, these are huge, uh, it's a huge step forward in terms of really uh, being able to build a safe system that can be deployed at the scale and solve, you know, a lot of those, you know, issues with, you know, supply chain, uh, you know, safety, pervasive safety issues, as well as enabling transportation for people and goods. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, let's move on to the question and answer session. So we have a lot of questions. I don't think we'll be able to uh, really take all the questions, but we'll try to group them based upon uh, similarities in terms of uh, the type of questions that are being asked. Um, I will uh, ask the first question and then Professor Vanit uh, will ask the question and then we'll kind of uh, uh, alternate between the two of us. The mm -hmm. first question is related to kind of safety. Um, I think the question is, how do you deal in the context of safety when AI never reaches 100% accuracy? And let me add my own spin on that. Um, the vision zero, if you see, is like really moving the US and European transport sector towards zero crashes in the next few years. But I mean, addressing 98% of the crashes is not enough for us. The last 2% really has the tyranny of uh, uh, the, the kind of all the edge cases that you actually see. So how do you address that last 1%, 2%? I know that you, you really don't want to use the data-driven approach where you're kind of trying to look at collecting all of these different kinds of data. But then um, how do you handle the uncertainty that is there in those final 2% of those cases. And when you actually do your simulation, you're trying to kind of uh, add various kinds of scenarios by adding various features in your kind of model. But how do you know what's the right kind of a, a feature to add? Uh, and how do you validate that in the context of an accident scenario? Yeah, so so I think, um, uh, you know, uh, with respect to the question about, you know, AI or any system, right, uh, is it, uh, you know, any subsystem, you know, is it 100% versus not, what do you need to do in order to build a safe system, right? So what is important to note is that, you know, there, you know, there is different uh, configurations that the system needs to handle, right? So the system needs to understand when it's uncertain, when it doesn't know what's happening, so that it can actually uh, it can react and go to you know potentially a safe stop or other you know or other configurations like for example if one of your sensors fails, right? What should I do, right? You're not gonna continue you know driving the same way, right? Because suddenly you are impaired in terms of you know uh, your uh, you know how how you are seeing the scene, right? So it's very important that the system is self-aware of, you know, is everything functioning or not, where potentially there is any issues, and it has the ability to degrade gracefully in those situations to, you know, from a very sophisticated, I drive perfectly on the highway to what is the next kind of set of things so that I continue to drive, for example, right? if I'm uncertain, maybe I slow down just to make sure that I can react, um, you know, I need a, a bigger buffer so that I can react appropriately, right? That's one example. If I see that there is a big failure, then maybe I need to pull on the side of the road, et cetera. And that's with these different levels of uh, redundancy and safety, how you can go from whatever the percent is for, you know, your canonical system to something that can handle all these different situations. And that's, you know, how we build uh, safety critical systems. In terms of the validation and verification, right? So, uh, you know, is um, um, the access to the simulator is a tremendous tool that indeed it enables you to actually say whether you can actually handle those scenarios like uh, accidents, et cetera, that you can't otherwise, right? If you look at the industry today, you can only do it for a small subpart of your system under ideal conditions. That's not the best way to validate the system, but right? you need to understand 
what if perception was a little bit, uh, you know, not great, and it failed in this, you know, you know, very correlated way? What happened with uh, my prediction system, my motion planning, etc. Right? So, you know, what we world, the simulator that you see today, is an incredible validation and verification tool that we utilize for our safety case. On top of this, you also need to validate and verify the simulator. Okay, and to my knowledge, this is the only simulator that you can really statistically validate and verify. That's the other, you know, another big, uh, big component as you build your safety case. So there is, you know, many, I, you know, hopefully that gives you a flavor of, you know, the kind of things that uh, that we do. But uh, you know, we have, you know, a best in class, uh, you know, system engineering and safety team that, you know, their job is really to, uh, uh, you know, build a redundant safety as well as validate and verify the system. Great question. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So I think the next question is around interpretability. Uh, there have been questions on uh, what exactly are you doing to make your algorithms interpretable? Uh, does that mean there is no deep learning? Uh, also the fact that typically uh, interpretability means that you are explaining after the fact happens, why did I make such decisions? not before the fact to basically say this is a safe decision this is a good decision and if there are certain perturbations in the system this will also do good mm -hmm. so what are your thoughts on that yeah yeah so so a, a great question as well so what does it mean for us to be interpretable it means that you know you can trace the decisions of why the system decided to do what it does in a way that is interpretable for humans. And it's not a posteriori, it's also as it makes it, it's making its decisions, okay? So it's not that like you have a black box system and then you have a regressor to regress to interpretable representations. The system itself has intermediate interpretable representations. And that's very important because for validation, for verification, in order to be able to do V, you actually need to decompose uh, you know, the system into smaller uh, subcomponents. And that is not at odds with being end-to-end -end trainable. And this is the misconception uh, uh, in the field um, that uh, you can have that the composition while at the same time being able to back propagate your signal all the way to the beginning of the stack. Okay, and that's the you know the AI, new AI technology that is driving uh, our self-driving uh, self-driving vehicles. Hopefully this gives you uh, a flavor of uh, what I mean by uh, interpretability. Now um, you can, uh, you know, we do, uh, you know, thanks to the simulator, we can actually, you know, understand how perturbations, physically realistic perturbations of the environment, whether it is the appearance, whether it is the actual weather conditions, whether it is the actors, which actors are there, their behavior, et cetera, affect our system. Okay, and that's the simulator is what enables you to do that. That's precisely why we build the simulator this way. Okay, so so again, it's a misconception: interpretability versus deep learning. Okay, and then the simulator is what enables you to actually really understand how robust you are. You know, do you have coverage of your uh, of your uh, different scenarios? How you can uh, you, you know you can really validate and verify your system. Uh, thanks a lot. So the next question is about the performance of this type of a system in a mixed environment. Um, I mean, if you see mixed environment in both the developed world context and also in emerging country context. So if you see, I mean, tr the transition to a fully autonomous is going to take a longer time, but in the meantime, you're going to be driving with all of these other human vehicles that are there on the road which have basically different driving characteristics. I mean, there'll be a lot of uncertainty in terms of the driving, fatigue, distracted driving, and so on, right? So these autonomous vehicles have to interact mm -hmm. with all of these human vehicles, both trucks as well as cars that are there. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the second part of the question is related to how this type of a technology would work or how can this be scaled uh, in the context of uh, an emerging country, let's say, I mean, you take Brazil or India for that, where you have a lot more mix of traffic, a lot more packing of flow on a single lane, right? And the speeds are different, driving behavior is different. So the transferability of these types of methods 
to a different context where uh, the rules and norms are very different. Yeah, yeah. I'm um, sorry. So, so it was about hybrid uh, humans versus not and emerging countries, right? Yeah, great, uh, great question as well. So the, you know, if the world was just robots driving around, you know, we will have solved this already. That would be a much easier task to do. Okay. Uh, but that's not the world that we live in today. And that's not, you know, as I mentioned before, how this technology is going to deploy, right? It's going to deploy with, you know, a small number of trucks and then, you know, growing and growing over time, right? To uh, capture more and more of, you know, the, um, I guess, uh, you know, the vehicles that you will see in the road. So obviously you need to be able to drive, uh, you know, at the same time as humans and be able to handle humans. So the, uh, you know, so the technology that we build is indeed, uh, you know, technology that can drive, and handle situations, uh, you know, on the road, uh, which a road is fully populated with humans. Um, and the the way that we do this, this is related to one of one of the things I talked about before, which is you want to make sure that you actually capture the diverse set of behaviors and things that humans can do. Okay, so in terms of you know our uh, you know our behavioral models, you know, we have the ability to have you know distracted the humans, humans that are actually uh, behaving in a weird way, uh, you know, long tail of uh, behaviors as well as canonical cases, etc. And that's why we have this zoo of behavioral models, very, very important, so that you don't overfit to the canonical human that drives well, because, you know, when you deploy this at the scale, you run, you know, these tracks all the time, you're going to see many more things, right? And that's very, very important. Again, the simulator enables us uh, to be able to test and train the system to handle, you know, all, uh, you know, all these different, you know, adversarial behaviors, etc. Um, so that's you know why we build again this uh, the way uh, the way that we build. Now as it relates to emerging uh, emerging countries and um, so there is you know the uh, you know the rules of driving are very very different. Whether it's rules that are actually written or with rules that are implied by the drivers themselves, right? So if you look at you know some of the countries that you mentioned before. Um, you know, you don't really respect lanes, you don't really respect necessarily, you know, traffic lights, you see all sorts of uh, uh, rare, you know, animals and things on the road that you need to handle, etc. So the, the type of planning, emotion planning, for example, that you will learn, right, will be different on those scenarios, okay, because you cannot drive as you do, say, in North America, in those emerging countries, because that will not be safe, and also you will never move, basically, right? And that's not that will not be a solution. So it's it's a much harder task, but you need to you know tune your algorithms so that they can handle those situations. Now it's hard to do it with a hand engineer approach because you now you need to actually design by hand all these different things, versus in a data driven approach you can actually collect data in those countries and then learn you know what is the best behavior that is safe that is according to the, you know, kind of the norms that uh, of how people behave, uh, you know, on, on that particular area, okay? And that's how we see, you know, as we, you know, potentially expand to, to different places. I want to bring this technology everywhere in the world, right? But, um, you know, we will start in, uh, you know, conditions that are better, more sunny, right? Uh, um, uh, rain, etc. you know, before we span to emerging countries, before we span to, you know, um, snowstorms and things like this, right? There is like different, different levels of difficulty. And this is very important as well as you validate and verify your system that you do it for your operation domain. And this is what we do level four instead of level five. We are actually, you know, deciding to where our trucks operate so that we can prove that, you know, they are safely operating that operation domain and then we can expand and, you know, the, the safety case to all the operation domains. But great, great question as well, definitely. Uh, very passionate about, you know, this technology should empower the entire world, not just the rich countries. Sam? Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Let's take one last question and then we'll wrap up. Sure. So um, the last question could be, how do you, um, what are, do you think are the issues of adoption, especially with uh, insurance company regulators and other legal issues involved for this type of business? Yeah, yeah. So, so regulations for, for example, now you know, on the in the United States, right? Um, I will say that they have made you know big strides in terms of you know enabling developers to develop the technology, while at the same time, you know, putting the you know sort of the restrictions so that they do it in a safe manner. Okay. 
Okay. So, so you know, talking to regulators, also uh, being very transparent uh, about you know what we are doing, what this technology is, what can do versus not, is extremely important, and it's something that you know we. Uh, you know, we do at Wabi on a regular basis, right? We have a policy uh, uh, team that, uh, you know, helps uh, and works with regulators in terms of, you know, how, uh, you know, uh, kind of what is the best uh, best path forward in terms of, uh, you know, a technology that everybody understands that is going to be a huge enabler, but again, you need, you need to do the development and the deployment in a safe manner. Um, the other thing that I'm very, very passionate about is that right now regulators don't really have a tool to understand, uh, you know, which system is safe, right? And, you know, um, the simulator that I show you today could actually be that tool that enables them to actually test everybody. And I'm very passionate about, you know, potentially doing exactly that. So that you know, this can, this becomes and you know the test that any self-driving vehicle needs to pass, so that they can be on the road. And I think you know it's, it's something that you know um, I think it's for the better good of everybody that you know to make sure that we have robust tests uh, before deploying this technology at the scale. So I think that that you know potentially is something that we are talking to regulators, you know, and that they are excited about, which I think uh, you know will really enable them to understand who is ready versus not. Great question. Yeah, I think we are running out of time. So thank you, Raquel, for that very interesting presentation and answering all the questions. And uh, uh, a special thanks to all of you for making the time to attend this session today. And you can watch this talk. It'll be, it, is, it is recorded and it will be available on the ACM uh, learning webpage. Um, you can also look for announcements and uh, uh, the next set of talks which are scheduled in the ACM activities. And don't forget, don't 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 forget to check out the the, the JATS website, the Journal of Autonomous Transportation System. Um, and please fill out the survey uh, where you can suggest future topics or speakers that you would like to listen to. And with that, we come to the conclusion of this uh, very interesting talk. So, on behalf of ACM and uh, Raquel, uh, Vanit, and myself, uh, thank you again for joining us and. I hope you'll join us for the future talks as well. So this concludes this presentation. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Thanks.